So, hope we're all doing good. I'm gonna just start by saying that I'm so excited to be on stage again. I think it's the second time in a row with um, Dr. Amanda Parks. She is okay. beyond one of the smartest people I've met and she has been so in the future probably for the last 10 years. So we're gonna start by letting her just talk through some of the things that she's been doing and then we're gonna ask lots of questions afterwards. All right, well Amanda and I have been working a lot together recently because I feel like the consumer has finally just started to pick up and certainly the fashion brands really have. Yeah. So when I saw you last, you were really doing your manufacture New York in Brooklyn mm -hmm. and now you are a global citizen working with <laughs> the Future Tech Lab just started last year? Yes, well, no, even more recently, in May of 2017, 2017. so we we're last year old, yeah. So the Future Tech Lab, where I've now become the Chief Innovation Officer, is um, a new hybrid model, a hybrid approach to move this, this industry forward. And we come from background in the fashion industry, Miroslava Duma, our CEO and founder, uh, it has developed many digital businesses in fashion, and she's a, a sort of fashion personality. And what we're really trying to do is create this model where we have an investment um, portion, an investment business, where we're investing in startups in this space. We have a $50 million fund attached to us. We also have an agency where we work with large fashion brands and some other large consumer brands. We're actually expanding beyond fashion very rapidly, uh, which is why we've rebranded into Future Tech Lab. And then we also have an experimental lab where we're basically sort of putting, uh, putting products into action, making a showcase platform and really thinking about what are the future perfect products that are well designed, that have the latest forms of technology and that really push the boundaries. And the idea behind this is to try to, to really transition um, some of the ideas that are happening in early startups or in laboratories. I come from an academic background and so many amazing technologies developed not quite to scale yet. And so how do we actually get across this valley of death in terms of funding and um, development around the manufacturing um, to put these into showcase products? Because part of what we need to do is show the fashion industry. <laughs> um, well, the fashion industry has, has been... Uh, traditionally a bit allergic to what's been going on with tech and wearables. You know, they're very much focused on aesthetic, of course, and, um, and so there, there has been sort of this, this divide. And, and so to show to the fashion industry we can make really elegant products, we can really respect the value system of aesthetics, um, and also think about, you know, massively new materials um, for, for fashion companies. Right, well, and when we were discussing this on stage, there were just so many different people in different spots of wearables. I mean, there was one that wearable was just like a pocket meant for yeah. you phone all the way to Amanda who's talking about creating leather from cells in a lab so now we see fashion brands to your point coming to you and asking for solutions because I think that there's a positive implication for their bottom line as well right so let's talk about some of the fashion brands that did come for example Ferragamo right huge name very well respected in the fashion world how did you work with them and, and what what was the process of getting them onboarded to do it in the first place? Right, so one of the, our very first collaboration as a company, we, we launched in May, we had our official like public launch in October, so everything's very new, but the, the, the first collaboration that we did was between Ferragamo and a small startup in Italy called Orange Fiber. And Orange Fiber has developed a textile that's made from reclaimed orange peels, so the waste product of the orange juicing industry. This, this is, makes a lot of sense, it naturally arose in Italy where they have a giant citrus um, you know, a presence, they make tons of orange juice, and literally one of the people from, this, from the orange juice industry is like, oh, what, are, what should we do with all this waste? Can we turn it into something? It's, let's think about you know, waste as resource, right? This, which is a new sort of trend in sustainability in general. So they managed to, so, and this, this, was, this started many years back. So let's be clear also, these things take a lot of time. This is like making new biotech. So they finally had developed this textile after many years of research and work, um, and they came to us and we invested um, you know, over a series of months, and then we fostered this collaboration with Mira being quite close um, with Ferragamo. And the thing about it was, it, there, you know, it was somewhat about, okay, how do we speak each other's language? How do you work, oops, how do you work with a big brand um, that has, um, you know, certain requirements around, they have to go to, it has to be beautiful, it has to be produced on time, you know, they need, they have all these consumer demands that they have to meet. So you can't really work, you have to make sure that the startup can deliver. Like, so one of the, that was one of the things that we were, you know, fundamentally, like, a, a part of. Like, we will guarantee you that we can kind of maneuver this relationship and get, get you know, startups are notoriously uh, super crowded on time, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so just making sure that everything works fluidly in that, across that. And so that was, that was kind of our role. This was very early. And we're 
we're not, we're not taking more of an active role in actually kind of combining these things. Um, but that's, these, these questions around how do, how do startups even first get contact? You know, right. how, do you get to, how do they go to talk to the CEO of Ferragamo, right? Exactly. Um, and, then, and then maneuvering them through the whole process. I think interestingly now, after this uh, launch, I mean, Farag uh, Orange Faber has had a million requests for, to make this textile because it's also, um, it's a beautiful, beautiful textile. Once you touch it, it, it feels like a silk. People think, oh, orange shoes, it's gonna be sort of like tacky or you know, orange peels. Yeah, yeah. When you touch it, it's like, okay, the proof is, is, in the, is in the fabric itself. They are now at a point where, because of various things, they can't manufacture quickly enough. And this is really a, one of these other issues that we have to get um, to, to be able to move from these capsule collections up to you know, being able to fill these purchase orders. And I think for fashion brands, it's a little bit about changing their business model, where if you want to work with some of these really innovative materials, you have to put in a different kind of um, research, um, you know, a different kind of programming. It's not just like a purchase, you know, it's not just like generally like buy the yardage, you know, click the box online. It's like maybe you have to do a big PO up front with money up front to, to allow them to manufacture. Maybe you do some kind of joint R&D work. You know, it's really about sort of owning the means of your own supply chain to get these new products to market. Well, and it was a huge success. It sold out right away. Yes. I would imagine that that is why Orange Fiber couldn't, you know, keep up and people want, in a world where retail is just so difficult already, if you have a product that sells out, I mean, the proof is in the pudding, like you right. said. So what is it going to take for us to go from a capsule collection that sells out to doing a second collection, and then from second collection to actually just being the main fabric of choice, or right. fiber of choice. So the, the manufacturing scale-up. So this involves um, putting into practice entirely new factory infrastructure, right? So um, another example, which, which I'll show you in the presentation hopefully soon. Maybe we could, can we just move the slides off my laptop? Is it? Okay. <laughs> okay, let me just say that on stage here, thanks. Um, oh, just put it in, okay, thanks. Oops. Okay, <laughs> sorry about this. Is, this is, this is awesome. Um, so to continue the conversation, let's see if I can double time here. Um, so basically, there's a company called Bolt Threads, which uh, manufactures lab-grown spider silk. Okay, so they, what they do, that they're not, they're, they're not, you know, taking the DNA of, um, from a spider and then put it into a yeast cell, so this is a synthetic biology process. This is a, a good version of a GMO, let's call it that. It's a, you know, biological, it's a um, new biological process. And then they produce the yeast cells to produce a silk protein. The fabrication methodology for producing this is much closer to brewing beer. It's like a fermentation of the yeast. Instead of making beer, they create this liquid yeast protein, um, and then they extrude it. So what, um, what Bolt Threads has had to do is not just set up all the, bio, all the processes of all the biology and research, testing the organism, optimizing all the growth conditions for that. Then they're setting up basically an entire brewing plant. Right. Okay, so this is new for both people in biotech and fashion. Right. <laughs> and so this is what's happening, and, and in order to scale, you know, they really do have to have these giant vats of silk protein. It's not a textile mill, and then, and then it gets extruded. Right. So that's why it's taken them seven years to make their first tie. The tie is now retailing for $370, and it's also sold out. And they are now trying to ramp even more quickly with making, they, they have a facility, they're sort of ahead of some, a company like Orange Fiber, but they've had you know, uh, over seven years of biotech funding at, a, at that kind of level, like in the $100 million range Is to get to this. Is it funding that's paying for this? I mean, why aren't fashion brands that you know, need to look towards the future a little bit more invested in this space? Well, that's a, that's a really good question. That's kind of where, why I've decided to take on this role that's very integrated into the fashion industry, even though I'm a scientist. So this idea being that um, uh, if you think about it from, from the perspective of like technology, like, you know, technology companies are always making their own enabling technologies or investing in them, acquiring things like Apple's buying sensor companies and Intel makes its own chips and right? They know the means and modalities of their, to, to create their own consumer products. They are fully invested in it, whether it be from, through ownership or the supply chain. Fashion companies are not. They don't develop their own textiles. They don't pay for textile development. They just go and see what's out there at the trade shows. And so, this, and so who is paying for textile development generally? It's more usually companies like DuPont or Lensing who are doing much more in the space of industrial textiles. So they're not prioritized for the fashion industry. And then you take things like lab-grown spider silk. Hooray! Um, and, um, and you have a, a sort of transition where you're actually looking at a biotech 
kind of you know, infrastructure in terms of cost development and all of that, and, and you have like a, an entirely new, new paradigm there. So, so, the, so fashion brands think, why would I invest in like a fermentation factory? Right. It's just, it's a, it's a communication thing. We have to get this, this language across and, and, and sort of start to be able to speak, um, speak, speak to different brands. I, I have one, one good story where, um, really quickly, uh, Diane von Furstenberg, who's on our mentor board, um, I, we were at our opening and I, we were showing uh, in Paris, we did a, a big show during Paris Fashion Week, and um, basically uh, we were, I was talking endlessly to all these fashion people. They were finally willing to listen and I'm talking about DNA transformation and synthetic biology. And, and then a couple weeks later, she's on stage at a, a different conference. I saw her talking and she, start, she started mentioning DNA. And I was like, okay, it's happening. We're doing something. And like that just it. came out of her mouth, yes, right? Exactly. So anyway, so let me just jump in now. I know yes. we don't have much time. I'll, Let's I'll have keep a things. Look at what you're I'll keep doing. things really, really quick here. We got it. So we'll go quickly. That's a snapshot of my life across things. We generally work on some fabrics that just involve process coating, so like hydrophobic, um, d different kinds of uh, sweat collection, microfluidics. This is all very much inside how we process textiles. Then moving on, this is the collaboration I talked about with, between orange fiber and ferragamo, so reclaimed orange peels. Um, uh, fabrics made from um, reclaimed ocean bottles. There's a whole movement in this. There's so much ocean plastic. This is a never-ending supply of, of resource. Again, this is a shoe produced between Parlay for the Oceans and Adidas, which you guys might have seen. So there's a whole mo movement towards uh, basically doing a textile reclaim. These are three separate companies that we've, and we're working with all of them. They, they could technically be competitors, but what we really see is to move the industry forward, we need companies that are doing uh, different kinds of textiles. So Evernew, for example, reclaims cotton. Um, Warren, again, is focused on, um, on polyester, and they're, they're actually working towards uh, recreating the, the polyester into a liquid so it doesn't even degrade when you recycle it. So it's like 100% uh, sustainable going back into the, to, into the supply chain. Um, another example of a reclaim is mango materials, and they literally take methane gas and convert it into a biopolymer, which then can be extruded into fibers. So this is not just waste, like material waste, this is gas waste. Um, really fascinating um, cycle. They're opening a facility right now outside Berkeley, so the, you know, the time is now. And again, this is another project, 10X Beta, um, working for the X Prize on a footprintless shoe, which literally is made from CO2, which is the ultimate waste. And they've developed a proprietary catalyst to, create, to turn this into a polyurethane, which they then can cast into, um, into a, a fiber for, they've developed a pair of shoes. But this is, it almost seems magic, like you're literally taking CO2 out of the air and making a pair of shoes. Just so you realize, though, this pair of shoes costs $30,000 to make, right? So we need to get, but, but, but there's nothing that is, that it doesn't have to be this expensive. This is what I talk about lab research, right? We have to just move this forward, it'll take a couple of years, but we can get there where our shoes are literally made out of CO2. Vitro Labs, we're doing a lot of work with leather. Leather is one of the most toxic parts of the fashion industry. Um, Miko Works is making a mycelium-based leather, which is the root structure of mushrooms. It's 100% vegan. It's grown to California organic food standards. You can literally compost it, um, but it is beautiful. It has incredible texture. Um, you can emboss it. You can dye it, all this, everything. Vitro Labs is working from stem cells. They're even trying to make, they're working on a biofur. And then Modern Meta, you guys might have seen this, it just launched at the MoMA show. Um, this is, they've, they've made a new material called Zoa, which is a biofabricated leather from bovine cells. And this, this they've created as a liquid. So imagine liquid leather. You can cast it, you can put it, you can put it in a different composites. It suddenly changes this whole system. You can, you can embed it with carbon nanotubes, you can mix it with metals. Suddenly you have leather that isn't about being a sheet or a skin. Um, this is the spider silk tie I mentioned, both threads, again, been in under development for 10 years uh, to make this one tie. Peely, this is a company that is working on um, synthetic biology produced dyes, um, so dyes and inks. This is better, more sustainable than natural dyes. They, what they do is they basically take an organism that makes a particular color, sample the DNA, the part of the DNA that makes the color, that color, like a flower that is yellow, they find the part of the DNA that's yellow. They transfer it into a, a, a microorganism, so yeast or whatever, that, that grows it the best. It's like a fermentation process, and instead of growing, brewing beer, you're creating color dye in a lab. Fully controlled, super sustainable, you don't have to use any resources of plants or water or anything. 
there's a couple different companies working on this technology, which will really change things across uh, dyeing. Um, and then there's some more like, uh, you know, thinking about things in, further into the research space at using biology. This is from my old laboratory at MIT. Um, this uses a biological spore that when it, when it actually senses moisture, so when you sweat, it changes shape, and you can create these pores. So these are active biological spores. There's no circuitry on this, um, opening and closing the garment to, to create breathing structure. Um, another, another idea of a, a reclaim, this is a, a new material um, from Duma Lab, which is based out of Tufts University. This is um, a plastic and a, and a sort of a, a a, sh a light um, textile that's made from chitosan waste, which is the outer shells of shrimp. What's beautiful about this material is that it's stable in regular water, but it literally disintegrates in uh, salt water, which is, you know, mat you know, it's ocean waste. So you can literally throw it into the ocean to decompose. Like, that's where it should go to decompose, right? It's a whole new kind of shifting model. This is some of their other packaging, which we're looking at using. And then, of course, the holy grail is how do we, how do we create the rematerialization of circuitry, like, like Ivan started mentioning. So this is a flexible biodegradable circuit from a laboratory at Stanford. And if you, just to give you a sense of, a, that's a human hair, that line across the top. That's how small and amazing. This is silk and magnesium and other kinds of natural biological materials. So what are some of the components that we're pushing forward to next? These are fiber batteries. Um, this is from Dan Steingart at Princeton. Um, and he's, it's literally a biological-based um, anode and cathode, you know, basically covering a microfiber, which can not only is it washable, the, the, the whole putting it through the wash and, and put it, mixing it with soap reconstitutes the battery itself. So an entire um, garment can be made out of this. No longer, I mean, this to me is one of the you know, most game-changing tech because every single device, every single wearable we're ever going to need is going to need power. Combine, uh, you know, then thinking about how we could have active um, active uh, materials for sensing using all kinds of piezoelectric stuff. This is Exo Nano, which um, you can use to, to sense and also to generate power in a, in a basis of piezoelectrics. Um, imagine combining the battery fiber I talked about with a solar fiber, so then it actually generates, it collects the energy from the sun and stores it. So then we have like a, literally a passive energy source. Um, and then this is an audio fiber. FOA is a new uh, a national consortium, um, the Advanced Functional Fibers of America. It's based out of MIT. It's got, you know, uh, $200 million of go between government and industry um, to work on new technical fibers. Um, and this is one of the first ones they've made. It's an audio fiber that both senses sound and produces sound. So imagine this as being a speaker and a sensor. It's kind of mind blowing. Um, and then also was ways that we can start to work with the skin, on the skin. This is a temporary tattoo that works as an interface to your phone, to a screen. Yep, okay, great. And, uh, and so here's another example of that. Um, and then this, this is an actual uh, ink that works as a biometric sensor. So it's a tattoo ink that can actually change color based on certain things about your, um, what's going on in your skin and your chemistry. So, you know, imagine... Uh, all, different, all different kinds of biosensing, like literally being part of your, part of your body um, and also completely passive. So I mentioned what we did with our company and just kind of this notion of sort of presenting science in the language of fashion and how important um, that is to, to kind of speak this language. So that's great. Okay.